Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sixth annual State of Freshwater Fish uh, around the globe. And uh, I like to do this live because it tends to be a little long. And I'm probably not going to be answering a ton of questions, unfortunately, in the talk. Um, also, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, I invite you to subscribe. Um, but uh, also want to apologize. I ha don't have the money yet to get the upper teeth fixed from the accident, from the injury that I sustained. Got the lower ones done. Uh, this year, I'll be getting the uppers done, and I'm getting the uppers pulled soon. So if that's a distraction, I apologize. I'll probably be a little picture in the corner because we're going to be looking at a lot of graphs and charts and data. Uh, but today, we are going to talk about essentially how things are looking out for 2024. Um, I don't want to toot my own horn too strongly but i will say that things like uh covid when that happened um we were in january when i gave my uh forecast for that year and that was something i said watch out for i have there's an episode that i put out in february saying you know get your fish food start breeding fish you're gonna make a bunch of money if you breed your fish at home so um I don't know. I've had good luck so far. It may just be luck. Same with knowing about Ukraine breaking out. More of it is just that I'm a total nerd when it comes to global politics and anthropology and, and uh, conflicts. And, uh, you know, just I just I'm, I'm fascinated by the world, how humans work and how creatures work and how they interact with one another. And this is. Um, yeah, this is the episode about that. So I'm going to, now that we got people coming in here, hello, welcome all my friends. Uh, I'm going to put up the graphics and I'm going to go, uh, not, I won't completely be gone. I'll be down in the corner. Um, so let's get this sorted out. All right. Well, that, that went quicker and smoother than I had hoped. All right. So Welcome to anybody from all over. Uh, I kind of ramble for the first few minutes because all our live viewers kind of stagger in. And this time we're doing a little early in the morning. So people might be a little sleepy, uh, a little, a little, uh, you know, a little sand in their eyes still. But so we're talking about the state of freshwater fish all around the world. So we're going to go continent by continent and we're going to talk about the big conflicts that are going to impact uh, fish. Now, we're also going to talk about things like um, pollution, like large uh, industrial accidents, like tariffs or wars that are preventing aquarium uh, creatures from coming out uh, into the hobby. So over the last six years while we've been doing this, you know, we've seen some major changes out of Peru, for instance, uh, they changed laws. Brazil changed laws. We have IBAMA, not the president, Obama, but IBAMA, the organization out of Brazil that decides which fish can be exported, put a whole bunch of new, um, a whole bunch of new uh, fish species on their list that can be exported. Now, they haven't really uh, realized that and exported those species as a whole, but it's opened up plausible deniability for those poachers in Peru and Colombia and uh, Belize that are saying, oh, we got these locally, even though they're coming from five, 600 miles inside of Brazil, it makes it so they're not super, super... Um, illegal i guess <laughs> they're not like a cites species or anything like that uh and so we did see some influx of some of the wild fish now another thing that's majorly been impacting the amazon that i wanted to, to mention now um in the time that we've been doing this also the uh the state of Colombia, the and i mean state i mean nation government uh, I may say state in several uh, cases, 
like Palestinian or, you know, that's not going to revolve around fish. So don't worry, we won't be talking about that much other than the fact that Israel exports a lot of goldfish. And right now, anybody who is of age is pretty much called up for the military. So they may have some economic holds on some of those high quality fish that had been being raised, uh, koi and goldfish out of Israel. But that's about the extent that we need to know about that whole area today. What we will be talking about is um, things like the FARC, uh, which had been a non-governmental, I mean, technically they claim they were a government, but they were a terrorist group that controlled about a third to half of Colombia for many years. And they have been at peace now uh, in large part, there are still two factions that are not putting down arms, but now that has opened up whole new regions, whole new rivers that Westerners never had the ability to visit, or if they did, they certainly didn't have the uh, technology and infrastructure to get fish out of those regions. Uh, likewise, Peru, unfortunately, there are some native reserves that are still demarcated as such, but they have been logged and or the natives that live there have been removed and or killed. And those regions will also be opened in Brazil and Peru when those natives are no longer there. So this is how human interactions are definitely impacting fish, including fish in our hobby. And we're going to try to stay in the purview of fish that would end up in your aquarium here. But it's worth touching on that a lot of the world gets their food supply from the same fish that we put in our aquariums in some cases, and uh, that they come from the same ecological sources. So I want to start out the talk, as I usually do, with just putting into perspective um, how much water there is but hello everybody welcome it's good to see all my friends in here this morning um sorry if i don't talk a whole lot to the chat we're going to try to keep this moving so that people can watch the replay since i know this is kind of a, a a specialty of this channel that i i try to do every year uh but if you look at this graph here of all the water on Earth, 97.2% is in the ocean. Uh, glaciers and ice caps, that's 2.15%, and that's obviously fresh water. And the uh, groundwater and lakes, uh, that's everything from like the Ogallala Aquifer, which is bigger than the Great Lakes in its footprint, um, and is being depleted by irrigation. Uh, that is also part of the 0.65% fresh water system. Also, the, the moisture in the clouds in the atmosphere, the rivers, the lakes, that's 0.65% of the water on Earth. So if you take down all the way to, you know, water that's there year round, either in a river or in a lake, we're down at less than 0.2% of the world's fresh water has around a third to a quarter of the vertebrate species of freshwater fish. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing that in these little islands, uh, so to speak, of water uh, all over the land masses, Evolution has been allowed to occur over time often and special fish that don't exist anywhere else pop up. Now, that is also why it's a little difficult to say this fish is in trouble or that fish is in trouble because a lot of times the fish that they're talking about only occurs in one lake. And yes, it could be in trouble, um, but it's hard to really classify the impact the same way as say birds that move all over uh, different countries and states and regions or um, animals in the ocean that 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 migrate or even you know deer or something like that that move across 
different regions of land, it's hard when it's contained to the water and we don't live underwater. So a lot of times people don't appreciate the importance of keeping those species and that diversity. But, you know, I want to keep things somewhat optimistic on this forecast outlook and coverage. And that is, you know, that an incredible amount of the episodes of Fish Street, the 200 or so episodes that members have access to, uh, that are the short form five to 15 minute ones. So many of those are fresh or saltwater fish. And they're, they're engineers, they're doctors, they're uh, physicists learning incredible things from one specific species. I mean, you look at something like a horseshoe crab, that's saltwater, uh, and the way that it has a basic uh, universal plasma and a copper-based blood I mean, it's really bizarre stuff, but it allows us to reconceptualize basic systems. You know, our blood has got the iron as the metal base for it and for oxygenation. So it's really um, incredible what we can discover in these fish. I mean, the most studied vertebrate of all time is arguably the zebra danio for medical experimentation. Um, mice are right up there with it. And, you know, you could argue probably for mice too, but they, uh, in sheer numbers, are bred all around the world. And that is a very specific fish from, you know, a specific region. So another thing I want to uh, discuss here, and let me let me make sure that we got these slides all up and ready. Um, and hello to you all as you're coming in. Also, sorry we didn't do this yesterday. My father had to have a surgery. It was a minor one, but he's back home and he's doing okay. He's alert and everything. So we're good. Um, yeah, Vulcan blood is copper-based and it's green facts thank you yeah if you got facts go for it star trek facts count um all right so here's another uh graph out of all the world's water most of it is in the oceans right but out of all of that it's either being used and we already saw that only like two percent of the water is usable another uh 0.65 percent is uh in forms that are accessible well out of that 12 percent is agricultural and irrigation canals and ditches and lakes and reservoirs um 10 percent of that existing slice is under conversion and only 7% of wild water habitats are now not being utilized for, um, you know, what they used to be. And 0.05% of all the water on Earth, like we were saying, 0.02 was with fish. Well, 0.05, that, that's including salt water, brackish water is where humans live so th places like bangladesh uh where they have massive amounts of people living on boats and living in houses along the coastlines and things like that um all right so this is where i like to start every year on this topic and it's a very Western-oriented point of view because you may live in Russia and think, hey, Russia's totally chill. Uh, I'm Russian. But if you are a Westerner, this is what the world looks like conflict-wise. And so this isn't a good orientation for the health of water around the world, but this will tell us some of the biggest blocks that we may see coming up in uh in fish in in where fish are coming from so places like papua new guinea uh let me switch over real quick see if it'll let me hold two of these now 
Um, hold on one minute, folks. Um, all right, hello, I'm back. All right, let me share this. We'll take a look at, at the earth. Ah, oh, here is the earth around. And uh, isn't that a pretty place? That That's us, guys. That's everyone you know, everything you love, everything that's ever existed, poetry, art. There it is, the little, the little blue dot. So if we start zooming in, let's start in the Western Hemisphere, because like I said, we're, we're talking about mostly Americans and Western Europeans. Uh, so we're going to we're going to zoom in here. So we mentioned that in Colombia, new parts, this dark green basically is the Amazon here. Let me just make sure that that's yeah. OK, that's showing up. All right. So this dark green that that's lush vegetation that makes up the Amazon. And can you guys see my mouse, my uh, the pointer under Colombia? I just want curious if you guys can see that. Let me switch back and see um, if you guys are able to. Are you guys able to see the uh, mouse on the screen or does it disappear for y'all? You can see the cursor. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So in Colombia, this whole mountainous region down in here. And this whole jungle region, so basically this whole part of the country was cut off uh, from exploration safely. Likewise, Venezuela has been pretty tricky to explore, but we do have people like Ivan Mikolji that have, uh, you know, citizenship down there, family down there, and who have gotten us amazing information. There's also this really funky spot right here where the river bisects uh three different countries and uh you've got you've got venezuela colombia and brazil all in this area and that is where most of the piracy of like the l numbers and stuff that's where they come out of uh they basically enter colombia there and there were pathways where they had to go through FARC controlled territory. Now, probably talking about all this, uh, this, this uh, stream usually gets demonetized. So I'm not even going to worry about that. Uh, but the newest thing that's happened that is kind of big news is Guyana here. This country, which um, I am not. Wow, I am not happy about how they are dividing this, by the way. Uh, but they have divided this country because right now Venezuela is claiming. So here is Guyana. This is all of Guyana. Ignore this dotted line. Uh, Georgetown is where all the people are, to be honest. It's an ex-British enclave um, or colony. But. About a million people, give or take, are going to be in this general coastal area. That's where all the industry happens. Uh, last year, we talked about how uh, Brazil was going to ban mercury uh, because mercury precipitates gold out of the illegal gold mines that are all over uh, Peru and the Amazon. And what they do is they use mercury, arsenic, and other compounds, but it basically allows the gold when it's only little flakes to all be collected into a ball. So mercury is smuggled out of Guyana, sometimes from the Venezuelan government, who's not known for being very honest and sometimes dabbles in some sketchy business. And then it either enters through the one road, there is one road that goes to Guyana and the road goes into Venezuela, Guyana, and then into this part of Brazil right here and then exits brazil so it enter it comes in basically a v right here um but right at the bottom of the v people come up the river on boats and go over land a ways 
and then they pick up right here off this river and they get mercury and it's like a wild west town there's a couple documentaries on it uh but they get liquid mercury you know like you'd have in a thermometer uh that causes birth defects and everything else but in any case so the big news that's going on here is venezuela has claimed that they are annexing two-thirds of guiana so guiana here has an amazing preservation record for leaving the forest alone compared to other countries partially due to population partially due to the fact that it was never developed that well as a colony uh people died a lot there of malaria and stuff but there are incredible uh, animals found up in this region uh lots of really unique fish that are found in this kind of um it's kind of like a, the Sahara, you know, it is the, the rainforest and everything are surrounding it, but there's kind of this drier area in here. And like the Pantanal, uh, there's the Guianan Shield, which if you zoom out, there's kind of some mountains and uplift that follow this general border of Brazil. And uh, also the way rivers flow, if you look at a map, it all changes on these border lines somewhat. That's kind of why these borders exist the way they do, along with just random colonial reasons. But Venezuela is saying we are taking all of Guiana up to this dotted line, basically. And uh, they actually have assigned government leaders to take over that place. So it is wild, but uh, yeah, it is insane. But the, <laughs> the Venezuelans have just decided we're taking two thirds of the country. What you gonna do about it, uh, essentially? By the way, I did happen to see Nirvana Aquatics, your super chat, thank you so kindly. Uh, in case uh, YouTube decides to be rude. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and then Mick is also saying, um, you know, Western parts of British Guiana, beautiful fish. Also, um, Paraguay, you know, Suriname. And you get some of the beautiful earth eaters and some of the really cool fish out of there. So if Venezuela, which tends to be very, very... Um, cut off from the world uh takes over that region it could be very very tricky and and also the question is south america slash is even america going to allow venezuela to annex all of this land here uh that's that's like the size of california uh are they gonna allow that to stand you know it's almost the size of california um and uh, i don't think they will i don't think south american countries will put up with that quite frankly we'll see what happens though um but that's going to be something to watch now all the way across over here uh across the world in ethiopia something that has not been in the western news at all is that ethiopian troops have been amassing up in this region in the north. Now, Ethiopia has some really cool fish too. Um, you've got like the Soda Lake cichlids and you've got down here in the south, you've got some really pretty um, and interesting cichlids. And you've also got some big old lakes. Some of them are uh, definitely not friendly to life, but some of them, are full of really interesting species and some of them haven't even really been that well explored because ethiopia was never fully uh colonized by western powers italy had it for a number of years never really control of the outskirts really just addis ababa and um that's the capital city here with millions and millions of people but it is a capital city in a mountainous fortress. Um, now, 
Just a quick history lesson, Eritrea and Djibouti, uh, these used to all be part of Ethiopia. And actually, uh, under the Italians, this area to the north up here is known as Somaliland, this part of Somalia. So if we're looking, let's zoom out so you can see the line better. So this area up here is known as Somaliland, and it has basically broken away into its own uh, country. The rest of the country and down here, the traditional headquarter of Somalia, Mogadishu. Uh, I wrote my thesis on piracy in Mogadishu for my history degree. And uh, this area has not had government since 1991, since the Beret government. Uh, and, or Berer, however you want to say it. But this region off the, the point here, that's Puntland, and this is Somaliland. And this is the Ogaden Desert right here. No fish here. There's not even any rivers. I mean, look at this country. No rivers, really. There's like three rivers in Somalia. So we're not, we don't have to worry about that. Other than the fact that Ethiopia, like I said, they've amassed 90% of their troops right now, right up in here. And there have been ethnic conflicts where over 8,000 civilians have been killed by uh, Ethiopian soldiers. And also, likewise, Ethiopian soldiers have been ambushed by militia forces uh, from these ethnic groups. But this area here, they want access to trade for the entire world. You know, they want access to the Red Sea. They want access to the Gulf of Aden or to the Suez Canal. They want to get products from Ethiopia up the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean so they can deliver it to all the major ports in Europe. Right now, they don't even have a port. Ethiopia is the largest landlocked country in the world population-wise, and it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Um, Pakistan is a very landlocked country, but uh, they do have the little piece that comes down uh, to Karachi area. So even though the population is up near Islamabad, a lot of it and stuff, they are uh, the biggest one. Now, also, you've got war going on uh, very possibly in the old satellite states. Turkmenistan uh, and Kyrgyzstan have never been that stable. Kazakhstan either. And Russia with Ukraine, they're kind of doing a test of loyalty with these former satellite states. And right now, Azerbaijan and uh, Ar Armenia and Georgia, this whole region isn't stable either. Azerbaijan is a crazy dictatorship. Uh, it's it's really wild. I, I highly <laughs> recommend you watch some YouTube videos on Azerbaijan. Uh, it is a weird place that happened to get some uh, natural gas and oil and uh, be at kind of the crossroads uh, traditionally of the Silk Road along with Georgia here. Um, but they have been having uh, ethnic problems. And uh, there was fighting, but now almost a million people are displaced in the last two years from that. And it's kind of settled down somewhat. But Russia could upset any of that at any time. And any of this becoming unstable is not good for Middle Eastern security, for world transport. And we right now also have the uh, Houthis, uh, both in Yemen, Oman, and parts of Saudi Arabia, uh, basically just firing off rockets at ships, both in uh, the Persian Gulf, in the Gulf of Aden, the, Air, uh, the Arab Sea, and the Red Sea. And even they tried to fire into uh, the Mediterranean. Now, they're backed by Iran. Why does any of this matter for your fish? Well, because if the price of getting basic goods places like aquariums, like lights, things like that that come from China, 
if they need to make it to Europe, they have to go all the way around the southern part of Africa or be flown in far more expensive air freight and not go through this region if ships keep getting taken, whether it's pirates, whether they're getting blasted out of the water, whatever it may be. Now, also, if Ethiopia starts uh, a war and takes back Eritrea, uh, which only exists as of 1991, I want to say, maybe 94 is when they became like a, their constitution was written and everything. But um, this region, needless to say, could kick off very soon because both this and Venezuela, like we were talking about, those are the spots to watch because they think the world is busy with Ukraine and Palestine and Israel. And they think they can maybe make a move, make a power play for themselves. Now this does impact fish and biodiversity. And also Venezuela is notorious for having the biggest proven oil reserves of the 20th century, uh, the discovery of what they had there. And Guyana, actually in 2015, they proved some oil reserves out, out here, just off the continental shelf that ends right here. They've got some oil, deep water oil reserves that were just discovered. So Guyana, even though there's only a million people, it is lined up to be the richest country in South America. And it's already one of the richest countries in South America, if not the richest uh, per capita. So out of the million people there, there's something like uh, 17, uh, what is it? 17 trillion dollars possible in uh, natural resources I was reading that could be extracted. So Venezuela wants to take that, but Venezuela can't even manage their own resources. They have the capacity to be making over 10 times the oil output in barrels a day of crude that they are currently creating, but it's so mismanaged, it's screwed up. Their engineers, uh, you know, they don't have enough engineers. They don't have the infrastructure. The infrastructure that was built by foreign companies got kicked out and then now it's falling apart because government didn't have anything ready to get in its place. Now, you may think, okay, well, that's good. We don't need oil anyways. It's messing up our, our freshwater ecology. And that's true. I mean, like where the guppies and endlers exist naturally. And in some of these areas like here where you get these big lagoons and, uh, and basins of brackish water and things like that, you've got some of the coolest live bears in the world existing here. And there are oil pipelines that run through some of these places and now along with you know deforestation pollution and other things that is no longer the case endlers are not really even found in the wild they're having to go to trinidad and tobago over here on this island and find some that were there that have been a little bit mixed with pets that have been let go uh in order to find the genetics of endlers uh because this area and this area and and in here where other live bears that are similar exist have been so compromised now the other thing that is a question is who else is going to kick off a problem for the world while the us nato russia even China now is tied in with issues uh, that are going on in Ukraine. And that did have a slight impact on um, that did have a slight impact on uh, trade for the, the goods. Like there were some things like Pleco caves and um, breeding of angel fish and things that was going on in uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev that was, you know, substantial enough uh, that it counts as, as much as any of the countries uh, like Croatia, Czech Republic, Romania, Poland. Um, now, the Czech Republic, traditionally, we just had an episode where I talked about the economics, and this is more about conflict, pollution, and issues like that. Um, 
the economics that are going on have shifted massively. So the Czech Republic over here uh, used to be the like fourth, fifth, sixth biggest supplier of fish for the entire world in exports. And now they're like number 12 and the Netherlands has become number six or seven. But beyond all that, Israel's come way up in production and also uh sri lanka has come up in production things like bettas and guppies and uh, live bears they're doing a lot of that and you see that in these developing nations um where there's a lot of poverty still uh, malaysia also we're seeing a lot of malaysian exports Singapore is still number one for tropical freshwater fish uh, exports as far as per capita size and everything. Japan is number one, period, and uh, it's close up there per capita even. Uh, Japan loves its fish, loves its ornamental fish. If you took out koi and goldfish from the equation, though, Singapore would be by far and away the leader. So if you care about nano fish, cichlids, uh, ornamental fish, uh, things like arowanas and stuff even, then you really are looking at this part of the world for where most of the production is coming from. Now, another thing is that Indonesia was like number three on the list, if I recall, of where all of our uh, fish are coming from now that are farmed, which is a lot of fish now. Um, the The interesting thing about that is that they are moving their entire capital uh, from Jakarta over to this island, to Borneo. Uh, and they want to, to put it in West Kalimantan, apparently. Uh, that's pretty wild. They are planning an entire new city. And if you look it up, the government, I mean, this has happened in Azerbaijan. They actually just picked up and moved the government and built a city for it. But they are literally picking a spot in the jungle and they're just like, let's build in Borneo and move a capital with 10 million people surrounding it and industry and everything and move it um, for a number of reasons. But we don't have time to get into that. But no doubt that that plan, whether it gets abandoned or not, could have a big impact on the fish hobby uh, big time. Now, another issue that, of course, could have a huge impact on the hobby because Taiwan, of course, is a huge player in the hobby. Although we saw recently that their uh, exports have really gone down quite a bit. Um, and some of that is a little bit of cold feet with China. Uh, China and Taiwan used to directly trade a lot of fish. Hong Kong itself, down here, Hong Kong is massive in the fish industry as well. You know, there's massive markets in Hong Kong, also mainland China right across the way in Shenzhen. This is the factory of the world. Look at how developed this is. This massive super city here has like 100 million people. If you count all these cities like Foshan and Guangzhou um, and uh, Zhaoqing and, and um, Hizau, all those places together uh, with Hong Kong, I mean, we're talking maybe even more than 100 million, like 150 million people. And there are any factory you can imagine has been put into this area and uh, along this river here. So if, if China decided to start something because it's in China's constitution that by the year 2050, they need to have Taiwan back under their control. Now they could just say, okay, guys, you know what? They're under our control. We control them economically speaking uh, or something like that. You know, they could pull one of those cards and say, yeah, okay, our mission's a success. But 
this is one of the most heavily armed regions in the world. And uh, they did some war gaming. China didn't actually come out very well on that plan. And as we know, if you guys recall during COVID and the lockdowns, when we covered all this stuff then, uh, most of the computer chips for anything high tech, uh, cutting edge, are coming out of the superconductor and microchip processing facilities and clean rooms that only Taiwan can do very well right now. Now, Germany is attempting to do some of that, but you wouldn't think about it as impacting the fish hobby that much, perhaps. But things like computers that are your point of sale system, things like the fact that cars aren't getting shipped out because their computer chips aren't being um, manufactured quick enough, or there is a delay in shipping, or whatever the issue may be. These are huge issues. And if there was a war with Taiwan, everything from your high-tech uh, LED, you know, uh, Fluval 3.0 light, little chips like that, China buys them. I mean, Taiwan has positions itself to be the chip maker of the world. And it's a crazy statistic. I don't remember exactly what it is, but they produce a massive amount. And anything that's cutting edge, they are set up to make with U.S. Um, kind of backing and support, essentially. Uh, so those are the real hot spots that could just blow up, uh, you know, the whole world's economy real quick. Um, now, another key area, just to mention it, even though this area isn't as hot, but there is the issues in the South China Sea and who owns you know, some of these islands in here. Uh, and you've got like the Philippines sinking a ship on a reef so that they can claim uh, an island. And they've got military guys stationed in this sunken battleship that they put out here. Um, you know, we got stuff like that going on. And there, you know, there's kind of these skirmishes going on about who owns what and whatever. Uh, You've got really the Philippines, uh, Vietnam a little bit, Japan a little bit, Taiwan a little bit, and then China a lot of it, uh, and even Indonesia because, you know, they care about this area now. Uh, all kind of wanting control authority of this region because of the Strait of Malacca. The Straits of Malacca come through here. And again, world trade has to kind of go through that. If it's coming from China, it's either going straight across the Pacific or it's going to cut through here somewhere, either down here or more than likely right here. And those are big choke points. So anywhere in the world where you've got these choke points here, um, I mean, I suppose here too, but we're not too worried about that at the moment. Um you know, it can be big problems. But sadly, uh, perhaps, the climate is also changing. So there's a chance that fish, uh, goods like aquarium, you know, everything from substrate to lamps, uh, heaters and products, who knows? In the next few years, they may be coming across northern passages. There could be railways in the next 10 years. Uh, being built, and now we're kind of flipped around, but being built from, uh, you know, China or Russia and working together, uh, the U.S., Canada, and wanting to go across the Arctic route, the polar route, now that there isn't ice there all year. And in fact, this year is the first year uh, that all the Northern Greenland Inuit people had to have food brought in for them because they literally were going to uh, starve to death uh, throughout the winter because they normally go out on the ice to hunt seals. So something like 4,000 Greenlanders, Yupik and, and Inupik and uh, I suppose Inuit out here, uh, they can't walk across there, get seals and things like that. So they had to bring them food um, from... Uh, over in uh, the, the Danes, I guess, who control Greenland. Uh, but back to fish more specifically. That's enough about world politics for now. But I want people to understand that 
why our price is going up 10 or 20 percent can easily have to do with something like some dummy got his ship stuck halfway turned sideways in the suez canal uh that <laughs> that it that can cause a complete nightmare in global traffic and the prices of things combine that with something like the fact that you couldn't use another route because of um you know this is the second most active pirate region in the world right here cargo ships getting taken and stuff um if that were to flare up because of instability in the government here uh you'd you'd see again just a skyrocketing cost in things so enough of the uh war the specter of war that's going on causing intercontinental inter uh you know global politics issues let's talk about a little bit of good news a little bit of bad news but in central america back to the western hemisphere in central america we see that like the Goodyear research group has 32 species now i believe it is of Goodyear's that they are tracking and breeding in captivity they've released some of them i was down in mexico in this region right here um along this coastline all through in he where is it so we flew in here puerto vallarta and then we drove up here and this whole area where the ameca river is where the ameca splendens are from and stuff this is where they would all be living but they don't anymore um partially because of things like uh the fact that they put a bunch of tilapia in these rivers that's another problem because you know if a country is unstable in their food or people are poor and they're looking for a food source things like bringing in tilapia which are a cichlid that can live in brackish water fresh water um that is something that happens it's what happens to a lot of big lakes is they get brought in and now we know better so to speak so you wouldn't think that would happen as much uh but it has happened to a lot of the massive lakes around the world now another problem that because you guys are probably sick of looking at the map we're going to pull up uh another um another little thing for you uh to show you is this let me get uh somewhat interesting you know i'm i'm trying to see possibly with the, the crystal ball of global politics what we need to be keeping an eye out for if you see any of suez canal the strait of malacca um the panama canal which was just expanded for super tankers from china a, spe a specific class of super tankers that china is bringing goods over on and that's going to matter to europe as well um the water level is too low so even though they expanded it they didn't put enough like fresh water controls in place to fill it with enough water to keep it there because it flows out to the ocean on both sides and there's been a drought um so yeah but let me pull up something to to kind of talk about yes and when people are hungry car great point when people are hungry they don't care about the damage to uh, an ecosystem of like little fish, especially ornamental fish. They want to feed their family uh, and they will toss in tilapia or whatever. You know, they toss in crocodiles or demons if it meant that they, you know, were going to see another day. And we would be the same exact way. Uh, but what I want to show you is something rather startling if you have never seen it before and that is the ocean so this plastic ocean here <laughs> is off guatemala this is what the beaches of guatemala look like and uh really really gnarly um that's a lot of plastic 
has a lot of plastic. So um, that is coming out of rivers from inland. And as bad as this seems, uh, the U.S. produces far more. China, India, the EU. The EU has gotten a lot better, actually. But is responsible for more than what we're seeing here. This is a small country, and it happens to have a river with a lot of people around it that are very poor that throw their water in there. Um or throw their plastic in there. But what I want to show you is some good news. Um, and a place you can go to get some good news rather than always crushing, depressing news uh, is shoalconservation.org. But I want to show you one more thing, which is, hold on, let me copy and paste this so we can stay in the same window, hopefully. All right, paste, boom. Okay, so this is called interceptor trash fence. This was the first iteration. So they dammed up that river that was causing all that plastic to come out from Guatemala's big cities. And they came up with a fence where water can go under it, but the biggest pieces of plastic can't go out. And within one day, there was a 20 mile backup up the river of plastic when they did this. So then they brought in these tractors and basically scooped it out. And now they've got these different fence designs. They're trying them all around the world right now. Uh, various NGOs, there's six of them now, six or seven now. And uh, they are pulling out this plastic so it can either be recycled or honestly probably thrown away or buried somewhere but needless to say like one day they had a people come out and pick up plastic in guatemala and just on this one river they got 40 metric tons of plastic cleaned up in a day uh so pretty wild what is going out there into the oceans too but now we're finding microplastics in our fish there's also a brand new uh, paper that just came out talking about how bad uh, the products we use every day as uh, consumers are, even in the United States. Europe has been much stricter than the U.S., but things like PCBs, things like, you know, uh, volatile plastic compounds, uh, they're showing up in the food web all the way from things like algae where you wouldn't expect it to be full of plastic micro particles uh, all the way up to you know apex predators where they might be full of plastic or turtles or whales things like that um so this is the website you want to know about if all this is bumming you out and uh this is uh shoal which is uh, all freshwater related and shoal is only five years old look at that so they uh they put out reports every year on new species this is the 2023 one there were 201 freshwater species discovered and formerly named um, there were actually more like 500 discovered, but named and papers written about them. Things like this that have been in the hobby for, I don't know, 15 years, 10 years. Uh, the beautiful black and red or black stripe. Um, you know, it's had lots of different names. The Myanmar. Um, but now it is, you know, described and it is a baddest that that is known. Um, they're also doing things like protecting some of the most endangered fish in the world, including large ones, and working with everything from local fish clubs and uh, nonprofit groups and, and even like artists and things that want to put their funding towards this. Uh, Shoal is working with all this. So in Mexico, the Goodyeads, 
This is from that region I was visiting. The Emeka Splendens and, um, had been all but extinct locally. And people all around the world had kept them and were able to re-release them at the university locally in Jalisco. Um, and now there's an action plan for releasing more fish. Uh, the university in Michoacan um, and uh, the Goodyear Working Group, along with the IUCN Freshwater Conservation Committee, um, you know, they're all working together and they want to release these fish and get them back into the wild because they've cleaned up to some degree a lot of the areas that were really, really polluted in the 70s, overfished or perhaps <laughs> um, had a lot of other co competition from non-native species. Now they're calling what they've done so far phase one and they have it laid out for how they want to do things. But my nonprofit, the Green Earth Alliance, we will very likely be working with Shoal, uh, Ivan Mikolji and I, uh, and Yelka, his sister, who uh, the three of us are the board of directors and founders uh, of the Green Earth Alliance that is trying to uh, hopefully keep an eye on these issues and uh, you know, try to do something before it's too late. But let's uh, let's go back to. Um, hold on one sec. Hi guys, how's everybody doing? We doing good? Do people need a little break? We're gonna go go a little longer. Uh, I've got now. We've got all the fun graphics to show you. Um, so about that. All right, so we've got our we're going to we're going to finish up our conflict uh, map. Melissa, hello. Uh, I said I wasn't going to say hi to everybody, but hello to those of you joining us now. Uh, and thank you for those of you who are members, who are sharing links, who are liking, subscribing, all of that. Just watching even you guys. Thank you so much for helping me do what I do at the channel. And uh, I know this is a bit of a bummer episode, but I think it's important that we um, we understand how global things like wars that obviously are not good for people, they're not good for the economy, but they impact our hobby too, right? Uh, so if we can connect, even if it's abstract, that you could be sitting in your home and not give one crap about what is going on in the Strait of Malacca, it can have an impact on your hobby. So if for nothing else other than a selfish reason, it should matter. If not for a reason of, you know, preservation of uh, biodiversity and things like that. So that's what we're going to go into next, which is the preservation of biodiversity, where we are standing uh where we are standing in terms of that right now. Some things have gotten better. You know, what's interesting is places like Colombia, where the FARC had been controlling the jungle and basically nobody was there other than some armed guerrilla militant. Uh, you know, you got right wing and left wing militants down there fighting it out over who wants to control the jungle, I guess. And then indigenous people who are just like, stop fighting. Um, basically, that region was protected for 50 years of the last, you know, of the last 50 years. It was protected because it was a war zone, because there were checkpoints on every road in there. Uh, same with Paraguay. Nobody went in those that region because it's a super dense crazy gnarly jungle and uh essentially now it is going to be fought over by possibly venezuela and venezuela now may need may cause reasons for them to have to assess how what are our gold reserves what are our tin or copper uh lumber 
what are our you know fish for food like they're going to monetize and commodify that land so that people understand like what's at stake so that company or so that companies or countries that come to bail out uh paraguay are going to say well what's in it for us can our oil contractors come in if we come in and we spend 50 million on you know cruise missiles or whatever if it comes down to that can uh you know american like chevron can we get like some oil rights or the uk might say can uh, bp get some uh rights to those offshore oil rigs and then it becomes are there safety standards put into place are there you know environmental standards put into place that then the outbreak of this war causes those to be exploited more hastily to fund the war and then all of a sudden there's oil spills happening so it's just crazy how all this can unwind and start to impact things but i at a somewhat existentialist somewhat uh manic level i guess i <laughs> i find it fascinating to pontificate on what will happen in the next year based on what we know now and and running down those rabbit trails of how it could impact different things so don't say you weren't warned something completely out of left field can still happen too but let's now look at some of the other threats that are going on uh and something's going on um oh somebody became a member sunny g welcome uh appreciate that all right i'm gonna keep going so hopefully uh at f people viewing this uh after the fact will feel like it's not a live stream where i'm just bantering with y'all uh but thank you all for being here and thank you for joining uh the memberships really do help they do okay so let's uh let's get up the newest thing we're gonna talk about which is AIG again, the insurance, come on. Um, why is it not, is that gonna work? Did that do anything? Uh, oh, it did, okay. <laughs> Sorry guys, all right. Uh, Big Steve, thank you for the gift. I appreciate that, my friend. Uh, I really do. Thank you. Um, Glass Box Creations, thank you for the membership gift. All right. So looking back at AIG's risk map for the year, this or the U.S. State Department from an American point of view or the EU's or the U.K.'s or Israel's or India's or Japan's, you can look at a number of them. They're kind of the same with that, like Western centric, like the company or the countries in green. Oh, we're so safe and we're so good. Um, yeah, well, we still have like what ten to fifteen thousand uh, murders a year in America, and uh, you know it's more dangerous just to walk around an American city than it is to be in Africa in a lot of these war torn regions, even. So it's it's a little bit of uh, American exceptionalism, to say the least. Uh, but needless to say, uh, the the places that are in green are supposedly really safe and no risk. Um, the places that are um, in red are very dangerous to travel to. Now, what can this tell us about the fish in the region? Well, if it's in red, that means that it's probably like an active war zone or something uh, like Ukraine, um, you know, like Libya. Uh, why does it matter that Libya was overthrown and that all that happened uh, a number of years ago? Well, because all of its weapons leaked into these countries that are now orange on the map, because all of them have fundamentalist groups, be it Christian, be it Muslim, be it uh, communist, or be it, you know, fascist, that are uh, rising up and trying to overthrow governments. 
and uh, it's just it, I, uh, it's wild. And, and you know, uh, Mick is uh, talking about Chernobyl over there in the chat, and that is a good thing to mention because you know whether or not we want to think about it and whether or not you can plan for it, there is always something uh, like that that could just kick off, whether it's Fukushima, whether it's, you know, right here at Hanford in my state, or whether it happens to be in some really biodiverse region. Um, pretty crazy. But what's nice to see this year is for some reason or another, the Congo and the Central African, well, Central African Republic is still considered at war, apparently. But the Congo now is like a risk, but not a huge risk. Like, watch your back, but you're not going to get killed. Um, you might get kidnapped, that kind of a place. Looks like Somalia is still in trouble. Um, but I mean, they're saying that about parts of India and I mean, a lot of these places, I'm sure a lot of you have traveled, uh, the Philippines. Yes. The Southern Philippines can be dangerous, but, uh, anyways, so that is basically a threat map. You can do what you will of that. Now, obviously people eat a lot of fish. A lot of our ornamental fish also get eaten. Um, there, so Tony, there is uh, constantly in South Sudan, there's a war, North Sudan, there's a war. There's also a major war over the giant dam that uh, Ethiopia and South Sudan also wants to create a dam, but they want a dam. Uh, I believe it's the Blue Nile, not the, I don't think it's the White Nile, I think it's the Blue Nile. And they want to, um, they want to control the water, which then is controlling the Nile River proper uh, upstream, which controls agriculture and everything for 100 million people in Egypt. Uh, and in Sudan, yes, it's bad. I mean, we're probably seeing thousands of people being um, murdered there. Uh, we're also... We know that in places like, okay, well, we'll talk about it again because it's going to come up talking more about our fish. Um, yeah, exactly. Stephen uh, says that uh, New Orleans should have been really like dark red on that map. Yeah, if they went by like what's actually dangerous, yes. So now here's another metric that you can use, which is land that's been exploited for its minerals and or for humans living on it. And, uh, I mean, it's pretty generous the way it classifies things here because like, oh, yay, the Sahara is intact. Well, there's not anything out there, guys. It's a bunch of sand. Um, and definitely, uh, the Southwest of America. Oh, great. You know, there's some little dots where Phoenix and like Tucson are or whatever, but that doesn't mean this is like some vast untouchable wilderness. Uh, now, up here, this area is pretty lush in in uh, South America and also in like the Congo and stuff like that, uh, Central African Republic. We do see some pretty untouched areas, but, um, you know, Papua New Guinea, another place. Borneo was a place where the, the central part was untouched, but now Borneo is getting extremely developed. It's getting logged and it's fueling all this red up here. Basically all the green down here where all our cool little nano fish, our axle rod ice, Sundadanios and our, you know, um, bettas and things are coming from they are, those regions are being logged. They're being planted for palm oil. They're being uh, grazed for cattle. They are being uh, drilled for oil, mined for minerals, and, uh, you know, lakes like this bizarre K-shaped Sulawesi Island of Indonesia, you know. It's a uh, wonderland for different species and their diversity. But it's also full of minerals. And uh, 
that means that uh, it's being exploited. And, uh, you know, it's also important to look at, like, the world economic indexes and things because that can tell you who's going to go, like, where manufacturing is going to go next. So, say China doesn't, so China's middle class rises high enough. Let's just theoretically say this. Um, Japan used to be a major manufacturing hub of all sorts of stuff. Mexico, too. Now, it's, their quality of life has, you know, gotten better because of, making that money manufacturing and working those hard jobs and working seven days a week, 12 hour days, every member of the family, no children, labor laws and sweatshops and stuff. It actually did raise a lot of those countries up to some degree from where they were. Maybe it's just in a few rich people. Maybe it's in a number of people and spread around. It depends country to country. But the places where you see the red are also pretty good indications of where there are a lot of people, not just where resources and nature has been destroyed. Uh, and you can see places like, uh, you know, Cambodia, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar are rife for being the next China uh, for manufacturing when it gets too expensive. And yes, China is experiencing a massive population collapse. So is Russia. So is Japan. Heck, the U.S. will also, unless immigration patterns change. Um, but I don't want to get into that. I know everybody's going to get all mad. Um, so this is a map of climate change's impacts in the last 15 years. I know the map's all distorted and blurry. But in the last 15 years, these are the places that have gotten uh hot enough that it's killing off life that naturally lives in these places uh the arctic should be more lit up but because the arctic is not a country it's not uh shown well and they mentioned that in the article that had this um so forest loss now this is something else i want to talk about and it's another controversial one that people are gonna say alex you stupid liberal um but this is why i care uh, and this is deforestation around the entire world by year. Okay. How much of it happened going back 20 years. Do you guys remember when all those fires were burning in South America and they said that the Brazilian leader was the Trump of Brazil, that he cared, you know, about industry and economy and, also, Venezuela was going on about that. Well, even though they, you know, Trump and Venezuela hate each other. Well, the worst year on record. And it's largely because of fire as well, which was burning land to clear it. Most of this fire is, in fact, intentional, uh, especially in the Amazon. It's Believe it or not, it's hard to burn down a rainforest without using a bunch of diesel and petrol or gasoline or whatever you want to call it uh, to get it going. Once it starts burning, though, it burns and uh, the ground that's full of carbon also burns. And in Southeast Asia, where they're clearing land, there can be 100 feet of forest floor, peat moss and duff that is burning. There can be carbon trapped there that's like 20 to 50 times more than the uh, intensity of what you'd find in, say, North American forests. So it's not just the trees that are going up. It's like burning fossil fuels, too. But here you can see that that year that, you know, 2016, that Trump got in and everything, that's the year that, boom, uh, all the burning was going on and the most deforestation happens. So things do change with economics and trends of, you know, drill, baby, drill versus, you know, uh, save the polar bears or whatever. Um, now, this is which countries have deforested how much of their the Amazon uh, that they have. So Brazil is approaching 30%. Uh, deforestation completely. 
of what was once Amazon. And then this is like agricultural or mixed use suburbs or rural farms. Um, so they only have a third of the Amazon intact the way it was naturally uh, in Brazil. Really sad. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. As uh, as Patty is saying, Bolsonaro is a huge D-bag. Yes, the leader of uh, Brazil was a jerk face, in my opinion. Um, but in any case, here you can see uh, the, the list of things going on. And I, I just figured I'd share that with you guys. We don't need to harp on it. Uh, also... This is where a map, see these, uh, these tan parts? This is Brazil. And you see these tan parts here? These are indigenous reservations that are never supposed to be touched. Well, these people are all gone. And uh, now they are developed and stuff. But look where the most mines are being built on lands they legally cannot be built on. Yet the most mined places of 2020 are these massive, the biggest in Brazil and the sixth biggest or fifth biggest in Brazil is where they are doing all the mining. And that's not even counting illegal mining. That's the government granting them the ability to mine. And like we said, that's using mercury from Venezuela that's smuggled in now. That's using, uh, you know, copper, um, arsenic, all sorts of really old school and dirty ways of mining, strip mining, burn down the forest, dam the rivers and sluice box up the, the rivers for trace amounts of gold. Now, can you blame people? I don't know. I don't think so if they're starving, but most of them aren't starving if they live in a jungle and they have their old ways. So you can also thank outsiders and international policies making everyone so plugged into the globalized world that they don't know how to utilize their local resources anymore. I mean, I couldn't live off my land here, that's for sure. Um, it, you may think that you can. But most of us couldn't. Uh, and uh, that's true for even people that a generation ago were living off their land completely. And now, you know, they're having to tie in with these things that are very fossil fuel intensive, involve transport into the regions they're in, and they're not surviving off the land. So things like Arkoff, like uh, Dr. Anthony Mazarol's uh, nonprofit, where he wants to teach the native people to be able to breed ornamental fish as well as catch them seasonally and sustainably and grow food fish in the same systems. Things like that have the potential to empower an entire state or region of somewhere like Peru or Brazil to have a means of extra income to have a means of their you know their their main income their supplemental income to lift them out of poverty still so they're not tempted to do the gold mining and other stuff that is really dangerous and bad for your health anyways um but yeah so now we're going to shift gears a little bit i want to talk about dam projects so these are dams in peru so who cares about or, or nepal who cares about Nepal? Uh, it's a mountainous place in the Himalayas, right? Um, well, we should, we all should, because uh, you know these areas are where things like the Mekong River start, right here, and the dams that get built here, uh, usually backed by China, sometimes by India, are basically uh, causing it so that silt can't go down river. So nutrients doesn't go down river. So that all those nitrates don't go down river. So things like 
um, the nutrient of manganese, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, all that stuff that's gathered up in the mountains that happens in thunderstorms over the foothills, all of that gets blocked up behind the dams. Now, in some places, they actually use giant dump trucks or pipelines to sluice and sluice is just a mix of mud and, and water, essentially, until it can go down a pipe or down a ramp. But some places have ways to deal with that in the dams. But, um, oh, we already looked at that. But anyways, I just thought that was interesting. Um, this, again, is, uh, this is a map of all the mines that are currently in South and Central America kind of interesting um and their impact is color coded but um we can look at all this another time i just wanted to give you guys an idea um also uh this one uh this one has to do with um conflict again so things got out of order in my slide deck but basically uh myanmar is 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 uh essentially at war they have a civil war going on and like if you like celestial pearl danios if you like uh gold ring uh danios tin winnies uh, erythromicrons all of that is from one little valley here the shan valley and lake inlay and its watershed and right now it is only being uh governed and protected by a militant group called the WA people, W-A, WA people. Um, again, they consider Afghanistan still at war. Uh, the Philippines, the Southern Philippines have some militant insurrectionist groups. And, you know, the thing that's not on this map that's really, really wrong is that Papua New Guinea is having a massive amount of uh, violence between uh, the indigenous people and various military groups. And uh, same with in Borneo, the hill tribe people have come down. This year alone, there was a massacre of 6,000 outside of Kalimantan. And uh, it was Chinese mining interests and also Chinese companies coming in to build these pre-built cities for hydroelectric dams so that they can electrify the island and things, which, you know, development, you can't, you can't fault people for, for that necessarily. Um, but maybe there's more sustainable ways we can advocate to do things here and abroad. It's just really a bummer when you've got some place that has like 20% of the biodiversity of the world and they're damming it up. And then there's like conflicts going on and then you get black goods or uh, like black market goods, like poaching of trees and animals to fund both sides of both groups that are fighting over these regions. And this should, the island of Borneo should be lit up red and Papua New Guinea should be lit up red on this map. And I don't know really why they're not, honestly. Um, again, more conflict uh incident reports now this is ethnic conflicts in africa right now and these are battles essentially these are five or more people um fighting and dying in a region some of these are like a thousand people but this gives you a better picture of what we looked at Africa, even though it said, oh, this is all safe uh, or caution, but you could still travel there. Like, look at the Niger Delta. That's because there's oil here. And in Nigeria and Niger, there, there are massive amounts of people and poverty. And there's also massive amounts of oil. These oil deposits here come in on pipelines and from barges. And the people there, it is insanity. Let me, I, this, this is something you kind of have to see to believe. Uh, but um, if you look up Niger Delta oil uh, refinery, 
refineries, uh, illegal refineries. Um, we'll, I'll share this with you guys in a moment once we get it pulled up. Um, so we might get uh, we might get hit here for a copyright strike, but I don't care. It's worth it, even if this gets taken down. Um, so let's let's fire this up. Share screen. Um, where did it go? Okay. All right. So, um, let's see what this. Ads for you guys. Okay. So. This has been a problem for a long time, um, but it's something we need to face while we're looking at all these conflicts and things that are going on in Africa. Um, it's, it's important. So let me get out of this because it, some of this stuff is like unbelievable when you actually see it that people are living in conditions like these. So hold on. All right. So here you've got the oil refineries. And here I mean, you also blessing. have... Activities of illegal crude refinery also um, thrives along this Basically, access. people tapping the pipeline literally it was a black Saturday for resident of Abaisi as more than 100 youths lost their lives cooking off the oil at different temperatures Most so that they can get Vaseline at one temperature you can get naphtha at another temperature uh and he also over and over there's these deficit. fires that happen in these shanty Too towns and slums where these people the live government. but also there's oil Should leaks and then all of a sudden the whole thing gets set ablaze now crude there's oil doesn't burn very well but when you've already refined it and stored it in a massive you know lake that you've built it turns into what looks like hell on earth um and there are militias all through the Delta that are funded by this from Islamic extremists to far right extremists. And um, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, here you can also see that there is um, an entire community here. Living these businesses in these polluted regions. There are over a million people in the Delta that live in these huts. And these are, these may be on the streets that go in for filming. But this is where people are living. And this is where these beautiful the people tropical here are left to wonder how to navigate to the numerous threats that uh, this crime-addled neighborhood is, presents. You know, so impoverished you militia these women or terrorist, you know, gangs and people are just subjected to, you know, terrible, terrible stuff going on there. And the same thing is going on in there. They expect that Lagos will be the first city with a million people. Uh, but if we look <inaudible> at um, Niger, Delta, Illegal, I just want you guys to see this too, because this is going on in Mexico. This is going on all sorts of places. This is going on in um, Malaysia as well. And people really are refining oil. Industry. 
it's just and they're doing it in their villages they'll they'll tap into an oil pipeline so and you can see what the result is these refineries are essentially like stills for so cooking alcohol leaks, so they tap into the, the line pipeline. they take the crude oil Mexican cartels are doing this too, and then it gets dumped into the river. They don't care. These two causes alone accounted for 98% of SPDC. You can see the oil spills going on here. The crude oil. But how they refine this stuff is literally by cooking it off. Dangerous. This is this is a process that's this is how it's supposed to look. It's very burning these plumes of oil. And that's to get naphtha. Or the stuff that cooks off very quickly. This young man told CNN, and the stuff that's like starter fluid for your car and stuff like that, that comes off first. Then you this get the gasoline, and then you you know each Legal stage continue. is different on this. But These people live and work in what looks it's like hell on, on earth. To move this, to to see. and on an you can imagine scale. if ammonia is bad for your fish. Cold, how do you think? Um, these um, conditions you, are yeah, that's, that's oil yeah. all across i feel very sad the lagoons not just and because of the economic sabotage but because of the environment that we love in the because hobby of the too. Fact and i mean if you look at satellites you will see black plumes coming from all of, oh oh i guess sorry guys if you can't hear me over the video thank you coro for letting me know there are um black plumes and that's how people live is in that like living hell going on all over the world wherever there's oil pipelines in developing nations uh it took it down anyways uh so it might that might have been a copyright thing but in any case that's going on in mexico the cartels are doing that and uh that's going on in malaysia it's going on anywhere that, that you see big oil refineries in developing nations honestly uh venezuela and soon to be maybe paraguay but that's where the beautiful killifish that we love you know things like the rocket killifish or the clown killifish things like um gambusia and uh you know blue galaris they come from this coastline region that we just saw what it looks like right now um so these are things to watch, and this is oil. Um, this is oil that uh, is just spilling out into the environment. Um, yeah, you have a good point, uh, Nirvana Aquatics. We have the technology to synthesize oil and petroleum products from carbon in the atmosphere, but there's no profit, so it's never going to happen. I mean, we won't even do shale anymore uh, a lot of times because it's too expensive. You know, it, if, if it matches the economics of the time, if oil is $200 a barrel, then shale is fine. But if it's $50 a barrel, it doesn't make any sense. And then whole towns boom and bust whole pipelines open and close. Um, so it's something to consider. Uh, I mean, I drive a car, not electric. I can't afford an electric car. Um, but these are the issues that are facing us from the trash to the impact that all of that's having on our atmosphere as well. Uh, and, you know, I don't want people to take away from this episode of thinking at uh, the um, that the point is that these developing nations, that these people are so amoral or that they're doing such bad things, because what we should be looking at is why are they in a position that somebody would put their kid next to, you know, 200 gallons of explosive gasoline and have their 12 year old kids stirring that so they can feed the other six kids at home because there's no you know there's no um birth control there's no not enough food and that's the only way to make a living things like this i'm not going to get too preachy but whether you're on the right or the left you can get behind these issues on the right there are a lot of christian organizations that do things to try to fight against this uh on the left there are a lot of 
you know, groups that are environmentally based. It doesn't matter whether it's ethical or environmental. These things need to stop and we need to look at the, the, the base causes. Um, they're human issues. They're not, they shouldn't be politicized the way they are, especially in the West. Um, and that's, that's what I, I want to, to be the takeaway from this is that when we build dams, when we uh, further our lifestyles, that we stop and reflect what the impact is. And I'm hoping that since we're all people who love uh, fish, we love ornamental fish, that just by highlighting what these conflicts are doing to the fish, to the ability to get fish, for instance, Congo puffers are super expensive because it's been hard to get stuff out of the Congo. Um, you know, if it's not enough for you to see that it's someone's kids that are out there in this, that are in these conflicts, that are in poverty, um, perhaps it is enough that you can't have your ornamental fish. So guys, that is where I'm going to wrap it up for this year. The predictions and stuff were mostly at the beginning. It's stuff to watch for again. Taiwan, Venezuela, um, Ethiopia. Those are the big ones. Uh, Strait of Malacca, Suez Canal, or the Houthi rebels shutting down trade through those regions also could cause big problems as well. And uh, yeah, exactly. Euro Gupper. The problem is that third world countries... We call them developing nations now so that we don't hurt anybody's feelings. Um, but no, you're, you're, my mouse is upside down. I'm a dumb dumb. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, the problem is that third world countries all want to have better economies as well. If we want them to stop polluting like this, we need to invest in clean energy. Yeah. We need to give them alternatives. We need to pay them to have an incentive to not run on the lowest common denominator. Why would they do anything different than we did? America and Britain uh, and Germany, you name it, had an industrial revolution where their skies were choked with smog. I mean, look at LA 40 years ago, 20 years ago. It was awful. <laughs> you couldn't even see. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your Gupper says, I was born in a third world country. I don't mind the third world, but I get you. Yeah, no, I was just joking about being PC. Um, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, my man. Uh, yeah, we try to do this episode once a year. I'll do an update if anything major happens. Um Melting glaciers are a big uh, topic as well, Mick, uh, because, you know, they change the currents of jet streams and things, which may not seem like a big deal to freshwater fish people. Definitely a big deal to, to saltwater, but it is a big deal to freshwater, too, because things like pollution and so forth move around and get essentially taken away from like the Mississippi Delta, from places like that, when there's a current that can take it out to sea when there's a gyre full of trash bigger than Texas or whatever out in the middle of the Pacific, it allows the creatures at our river mouths and deltas to uh, live a cleaner life. Um, so yeah, it is important and it will change things. It will change how much rain there is. It will change how much water there is and how deep things are. So the world will be changing a lot. Um, if you don't believe that the climate is changing, I mean, it always has been, but if you don't believe that it's a bit accelerated and uh, probably in ways we have no idea of, we might be wrong in some of the things we assume are going on and we're probably correct in some, probably uh, regardless of all that, big changes are happening faster than they would if humans didn't exist. I think that's, if you believe in science and peer reviewed data, that 
it's it's irrefutable and i'm sorry if you don't believe that i mean you're still welcome here on the channel and everything but uh that is what peer-reviewed science says unanimously now there are a few people paid by like you know shell or something that may have some paper that says something against that but even now shell has papers saying yes climate change is happening and this is what we're doing about it you know the oil companies have no investments in other oil companies. They have no petrol investments at all anymore. It's all clean energy and mutual funds and stuff like that. Uh, Ty Miller, thank you for becoming a member of Fish Dreams. I know you were a member, but welcome back. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, it really does help support the channel when y'all uh, are members. Also, go to the community tab. You get uh over 200 episodes of history that are kind of audio based i'm going to try to get back onto that uh track of doing those again uh where there's no production value essentially it's just me kind of um collating and putting together uh freshwater fish related news stories because i think it also highlights things like oh we have a new bulletproof vest because of the way that Corydora uh, scales stack with one another. I'm making that up, but you know, like just these crazy innovations we make or the fact that they figured out how to make Bacopa uh, monieri, you know, the most common plant in the aquarium hobby of uh, Bacopa species. They figured out how to make it bioluminesce and they had a prototype of basically walkways lit by Bacopa that was putting off energy like fireflies. Um, so, yeah. But on that note, everybody, thank you for coming and joining. I hope everybody does have an amazing New Year's. It may be the new year before I speak to y'all again. Um, but thank you guys so much for uh hearing what i have to say um for being bummed for an hour or two uh once a year i'm sure most of you are thinking about it far more than that but um at the least uh yeah glow bacopa but it's actual glow like if they made glow fish that actually glowed without a black light that would might be that might interest me uh i would think that it would annoy them if they hadn't evolved with it, like, you know, oh, why is the back of my head illuminating my eyes? But whatever. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, thanks, guys. And uh, Miss Hissy Fit, I'm glad you caught some of it, too. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, all of y'all joined me. Looks like people are peeling off anyhow. Uh, it was a long, a long haul, this live stream, I know, for a heavy topic. But thank you guys so much. Thank you for supporting the channel. Thank you guys for being my friends and, you know, forwarding me news articles and interesting things. And hopefully in the new year, we'll be talking about all the amazing fish that were discovered this year, 2023. Uh, that usually doesn't get compiled till like May or June. But the last few years, I've been able to piece it together for the most part, missing maybe 10 or 12 freshwater species out of the 150 to 200 that come out a year. And it looks like this year, I think we're at like 240. So we're getting better with DNA testing at identifying new species that are about to disappear. No, that are about to <laughs> new species being discovered and uh, hopefully that we can make sure are protected. All right, you guys. Uh, well, thank you so much. Much love. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, and I will talk to you later. I really do appreciate it when y'all share uh, these episodes because they definitely don't get promoted by the algorithm uh, with subject matter and especially because I showed video content, uh, let alone get monetized. But I think they're worth it every year. So thank you. And also feel free to look at past years and see how I did on my predictions or uh, thoughts. All right, guys, much love, and I will talk to you later. Bye.